Welcome to this SY3 screencast where we're going to look at pluralist theories of power in the state. Now this perspective pluralism is part of a broader topic about the nature and distribution of power in modern democracies. And this topic has come up on every single past exam paper so far, so it's obviously really important during your revision to get to grips with this topic area. So as usual, try to make lots of notes as we go through this presentation. Before we look at the pluralist perspective, let's just remind ourselves about this concept of power. So we can see here a definition based on the work of Max Weber, the idea that power is the ability to influence the behaviour of others in a manner not of their choosing. So it's about your ability to get your own way, even when other people resist. And Stephen Luke suggested that power can be exercised in three different ways. Firstly, it's about the ability to influence and implement decisions which affect other people. But secondly, you've got what he calls non-decision-making power, or agenda management. And that's the ability of particular groups and individuals to set the political agenda and stop certain issues from being discussed altogether. And then finally, but maybe most importantly, you've also got what Luke calls the manipulation of wishes. And this is the power to manipulate what people think that they want. So this is what we often call in sociology, ideological power. So let's focus now specifically on pluralist approaches to power. You might remember that we looked at pluralist theories last year in the second half of the course when we looked at the topic of the mass media. For example, pluralism was part of this theoretical debate uh, about who controls the media. So we had the traditional Marxist perspective that argued that the media was controlled by a capitalist class, and then diametrically opposed to that perspective we had pluralism that argued that ultimately the audience were in control of the media. And the debate in politics about power and the state is very similar to that work that we did last year. So you've got Marxists who argue that the state is largely under the control of the capitalist class, whereas you've got the pluralist perspective that argues that ultimately the state within a democracy is under the control of the people, it's under the control of the electorate. OK, there are two versions of pluralism to try and remember for the exam. You've got classical pluralism, which is the original approach, and then you've got a modified version of pluralism called elite pluralism that tries to take into account some of the criticisms that were made of the original theory. Unlike Marxist perspectives, which argue that political power is concentrated in the hands of the ruling class, pluralism argues that power in a representative democracy is widely dispersed. And this simply means that they argue that power is shared by lots of different groups and individuals who are often in competition with one another. And the technical term for this is polyarchy. So a polyarchy is a political system where lots of different groups can influence the political process. One of the main reasons that classical pluralists argue that a wide range of interests are represented in a democracy is they argue that political parties have to represent a very broad range of interests if they're going to win elections. And they would argue that if the existing parties do not do that job, then there's always the potential for new political parties to emerge. So, for example, in the late 19th century, when the main political parties didn't really represent the working class, we saw the emergence of the Labour Party. In recent times, because many members of the public have felt that the existing political parties are not Eurosceptic enough, we've seen the emergence of a UK independence party. So it's the competitive nature of modern democracies that ensures that a broad range of interests are represented within the political system. From this perspective, power bubbles up from the grassroots, and political parties have to compete for the support of voters in the electoral arena in the same way that businesses have to compete for consumers in the marketplace. Another way in which power bubbles up from the grassroots is through the existence of pressure groups. 
and pressure groups are organisations that try to influence public opinion and the policies of the state. And although some pressure groups do represent the interests of the rich and powerful, such as the CBI, there are lots of other pressure groups that represent other types of groups within society. For example, ordinary workers had the right to join a trade union. And for pluralists, what this means is that the power of big business is balanced out by the power and influence of other types of pressure groups that represent different groups within society, including trade unions. And the technical term for this process is countervailing power. So, the power of big business is not absolute. It's checked by the countervailing power of other groups, including trade unions, environmental groups, and a range of other pressure groups. And pluralists would reject the Marxist idea that the state is simply an instrument of the ruling class. For pluralists, the role of the state is to act a bit like a referee, to arbitrate between the various pressure groups which seek to influence decisions. So the state is essentially an honest broker. So a quick recap. Classical pluralists argue that representative democracies like Britain and America are polyarchies, and this simply describes a political system where power is spread out and dispersed rather than being concentrated in the hands of a small group. And, and then finally, they argue that the state is neutral in disputes among groups, that it has no inherent interest of its own, and therefore can arbitrate among the competing interest groups. So from their perspective, the state is like an umpire or judge. And then I think this quote from Robert Dole really summarises the essence of classical pluralism, the idea that there are multiple centres of power, none of which is or can be wholly sovereign. In order to display the skill of evaluation, there are two more things that we need to do in this presentation. We need to briefly look at whether or not there's evidence to support this optimistic view of power within modern democracies. And secondly, we need to look at some of the criticisms, some of the weaknesses of this theory. The classic study used to support the pluralist perspective is Who Governs by Robert Dahl. And in this study, Robert Dahl is very clear that in order to answer this question, you have to focus on things that can be observed and measured. You have to focus on concrete decision making. So Dahl carried out an in-depth analysis of the decisions taken in a town in Connecticut in America called New Haven. And based on his careful examination of the decisions taken by that local government, he rejected the idea that a ruling elite was running that particular town. In fact, he came to the conclusion that the city government did its best to balance the competing interests of all of the different people it governed. So from his perspective, in his case study, politics was all about compromise. However, Robert Dahl's methodology has been criticised by Stephen Lukes because he argues that it's one-dimensional. It focuses merely on decision-making and doesn't take into account other types of power, including agenda management and the manipulation of wishes. In a globalised economy, classical pluralism also seems very dated. In the past, when there were stricter controls on the free movement of capital, there was much more potential for trade unions and other pressure groups to exert power over the state and act as a countervailing force to the power of big business. But Marxists would argue that globalisation has concentrated so much economic power in the hands of transnational corporations and big investment banks that they now have the economic resources to overwhelm the political process and cancel out the interests of other groups. For example, Nicholas Shackson, in his recent book Treasure Islands, argues that America and Britain are now captured states. They've been captured by the interests of the financial elites that control the city of London and Wall Street. So there is now a modified version of pluralism called elite pluralism that takes on board some of these criticisms.
For example, elite pluralism accepts that the unequal distribution of income and wealth in countries like America makes equal political influence impossible in practice. And elite pluralism takes into account Luke's second face of power, agenda management or non-decision making, by acknowledging the role of insider pressure groups who have the ear of the government in shaping the political agenda. So from this perspective, Western democracies are far from perfect, they're in need of reform, and they are at best deformed polyarchies. And maybe one of the things that will help to reform established democracies is the use of new technologies that have the potential to make it much easier for groups without much money, without many resources, to have an influence on the political process. And there's much more detail on this topic in the screencasts on new social movements.